Hello, uh, my name is Justin Sherrill, and I'm here with uh, three of my colleagues who have been working on the Pulp3 integration with Catello for the past um, however many months it's been. The things we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about running with Pulp3, um, the applicability changes that, that come with it, how, we, how you migrate your Catello foreman installation to Pulp3, and then a bunch of troubleshooting tips um, to help when things go wrong. Quick introduction. Uh, you may, from time to time, see the word pulp cord. That's synonymous with pulp three for now. Um, it's sort of the the name that we, we're using in services and the database on the smart proxy feature to uh, mean the next or the 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 new pulp. So when pulp four doc, 4.0 comes out, it's, it will likely be the same architecture, the same code base. Um, it'll still we can still refer to it as pulp core. So whenever you see pulp core, just think pulp three. And we've been running with pulp three for quite a while now, um, upstream since Catello three uh, fifteen. When you upgraded or installed three fifteen, you got pulp three. And initially, it was just Docker and file, um, but with three sixteen, we added Yum. And um, with 3.17, we're, oh, we'll actually get into that in a minute. But th there are some major differences within Pulp 2 and Pulp 3. Uh, in Pulp 2, really, the, the biggest concept was you had a repository. And everything was controlled through there. In Pulp 3, there's a whole bunch of, of new concepts. You have a repository, which is sort of just a, a named entity which points to repository versions. So whenever content is added to a repository, you, you get a new version, which is nice. And that, that enables Catello to do a lot of optimizations that we couldn't do before. Um, a remote is the object which tracks how you sync a repository, so what URL to use, what certificates to use, that sort of thing. A publication is sort of a snapshot of how it looks to the, how the content looks to a user or to a client. So that, that would include like things like the metadata that is published. And then a distribution is how you actually provide that to a client. So what path is it available um, on the web server, for example? Um, and now I'm going to hand it over to uh, Samir to talk about running with Pulp3. Thanks, Justin. So, uh, on a Pulp3 box, uh, when you start running Pulp3, there are some services that you need to be aware of. So uh, the first one is Pulp Core API. This service basically serves the Pulp Core REST API to the users. And uh, in Catalog, we consume it using binding, uh, Ruby bindings uh, that the Pulp team generates for us. The second service is the Pulp Core content service, which serves Pulp content to the clients. Uh, the last three services here, Pulp Core resource manager, uh, the worker services, and the Redis service, uh, these are used for task management in Pulp Core. And uh, for the worker services uh, with Pulp 3, you can basically scale it up uh, and uh, you can easily start more services by like uh, system CTL start another worker and the resource manager is smart enough to identify that worker and it will scale accordingly. Uh, next up is the settings file, uh, which is which lives in etsypub settings.py. Uh, the defaults are set using the installer and you should probably not have to change much there. Uh, next thing is uh, with Pulp Core, we are dropping MongoDB. Uh, Pulp Core runs with PostgreSQL 12, which is the same version that Foreman uses. Uh, the content, the physical content, is stored in directory varlib pulp artifact, and the uh, generated metadata files also live in the same directory. And along with this, the symlinks that we used to have in Pulp2 uh, for the published content views, et cetera, those are going away. So basically, the content itself has paths to artifacts that can identify which content uh, belongs to 
uh, with content view, etc. Uh, yeah. So also this, uh, we are trying to have feature parity between Pulp 2 and Pulp 3, so it won't be immediately obvious to users if you're running Pulp 2 or Pulp 3. We have the capability and features API on Smart Proxy that you can look up to see which contents are running on uh, Pulp 3, etc. Just the next. All right. So this is the uh, bird eye view of the Pulp3 architecture. So we have the two services, Pulp Core API and the content service, which runs behind the Apache web server. Both of these talk to the PostgreSQL database. And parallelly, we have the task management for Pulp Core, uh, which has the resource manager and all the workers that uh, you spawn. Which, also, which is based on the uh, Redis queue management. Yeah. So some notable changes between Pub Core and Pub 2 are that the container registry on port 5000 is, no, uh, is now gone. Uh, we have the authenticated registry on port 443 now. Also, OS3 and Puppet module content types are being deprecated, uh, so you won't have that with Pulp3. Catalog agent is probably going away with Pulp3. This is still under consideration, so uh, we'll see how that goes. Another change is that uh, you can have HTTPS access on repositories without certificate protection, so this is another feature you have. And some additions that we might add in the future is support for Ansible collection content type. And uh, uh, the team is working on the import export uh, feature. And we are hoping to get this merged soon. And I'll hand over to Ian now. OK, thanks, Samir. All right, so on to applicability. Um, so now that we're moving to Pulp 3, from a backend perspective, um, applicability uh, where, in case you don't know, um, applicability is where uh, Catello calculates what software packages can be updated on your system. Um, from a backend perspective, it's changing completely. So where Pulp 2 handled the applicability for us, and we just kind of pulled that information, um, it's no longer handled by Pulp. So applicability is calculated all from the Catello database now. From the user perspective, um, you shouldn't be seeing uh, any changes, essentially, um, except the fact that we're trying to make it um, match uh, DNF even better than Pulp2 did before. Um, we're trying to make sure we have parity with DNF instead of parity with um, Pulp2, just to try to keep that experience um, straight. So I'm just going to run through a couple new changes, um, good changes for applicability with Pulp3. So let's see, I mentioned it was calculated by Catello. Um, one thing that's nice is that um, if your hardware can handle it, you can spin up more Dyneflow workers, so you can handle the more uh, applicability calculations um, concurrently. And then we have a couple of features that will make applicability calculation even better. So firstly, there is um, how we call it, deep duplication of the work between host requests. So you'll see, I'll explain this in more detail when I get to um, the uh, applicability software overview on the next slide. But uh, essentially, applicability requests can come in from all sorts of different sources. So like if a host uploads its package profile, you'll have to uh, calculate applicability. Um, if a uh, repository changes, you'll have to calculate it. If someone clicks the calculate errata button on the content host change, same thing. So And these things can all happen at the same time. So what's great is that if these all get pushed up for the same host, let's say a host has like five different calcul uh, applicability calculations, there will only be one because when we pull one host, we pull every um, instance of that host from the queue. And that'll make more sense on the next slide. But we just want to make sure that there's only one actual calculation that gets run, not many. Um, and then likewise, um, well, so its applicability will now be better at, for single hosts, it's also better for groups of hosts too. 
um, because we can process up to 50 hosts um, in a foreman task. And that's also configurable with this applicability batch size setting. So we'll pull that many hosts. Um, they'll all be, they'll all have their deep duplication and then it'll all be processed in a single task. Okay, so next slide, please. So here's a software overview of how this works. So on the left, we have, for example, a repository or a host applicability regeneration task. Two things happen after that gets kicked off. So firstly, the host gets put on the applicable host queue. And then uh, a, a host applicability generation event gets stuck on the event queue. When that event is popped off the queue, that event will then pop off um, n number of hosts or applicability batch size number of hosts, also deduplicated at this point. So if you had multiple host ones there that were further up the queue, they would all be pulled. Um, and then those are pulled off and they have their applicability calculated. Um, it's relatively simple from that standpoint. Um, and we hope that this uh, simplicity uh, makes things better going forward with Pulp 3. Um, yeah, that's enough said there. Let's see. So, okay, that's enough about um, applicability. I'll be glad to answer, help answer any questions about that. But now let's talk about migrating to Pulp 3. So if you saw, if you used Catel back at 3.15, actually I'll give just a slight history about the um, Pulp 3 and the migrations. Um, in 3.15, we allowed you to migrate your Docker and uh, file content to Pulp 3. That was still a tech preview. Um, in 3.16, uh, it was still Docker and file, but if you had a fresh install, you could use yum content on Pulp 3. Um, on 3.17, you'll be able to migrate all of your content um, over, but it's still considered a tech preview because um, in 3.18, that's the release where it's more likely that migration fixes are going to make it to. Um, so if you're holding out for the best experience um, to migrate to Pulp 3, 3.18 um, will be that. So, and also furthermore, why 3.18 is a bit better, um, we have this, we'll have this new tool, uh, a rake task, or sorry, a form maintain um, task, which calls a rake task, which we call the migration stats. It'll show you a nice little window there so you can check up on your content um, and how it's migrated, and we give you a little note to make sure you, to remind you to have enough storage space. Um, and as for how the migration actually works, if you haven't tried it before, um, so there is the actual forum maintain content migration, um, which you can do over and over again, and but assuming you haven't run the switch over yet, so you're not on pulp three yet, but your content is moving over, um, so you can do it in small chunks. Um, so that you won't have one absolutely massive migration at the end if you if you wish to do so. Um, and then when you're ready to commit to running to Pulp 3, you run the switch over, and that's a one-time job. Um, so that'll run, and then after that, you'll be on Pulp 3. And um, I want to emphasize here that if you have any issues during the migration step, um, it shouldn't you know be a huge problem for your system. Of course, let us know in the uh, on the community forums, and that's fine. But one thing I want to make sure is that if you have an issue during the switchover, um, definitely let us know as soon as possible because um, the switchover is a critical step, and we just want to make sure that um, nothing happens uh, to your system. So, okay, next slide, please. Um, all right, so great. So your smart proxy, this um, can, is migratable as well, um, starting in Catella 4.0. And you sort of have two different paths you can take. So firstly, you can just make a new smart proxy. Um, and it'll just have Pulp 3. Um, but you'll have to, of course, reset everything up. You'll have to resync, get your hosts on it. Um, and there's no downtime in this example because your Pulp 2 smart proxy would still be sitting around um, serving your requests. Or uh, if you don't want to spin up a new smart proxy, you can upgrade your old one as well. Um, so Pulp 2 will be kicked out, um, and then you'll get the upgrade, but then you'll have to resync your content into Pulp 3. Um, but then once that's done, you'll be all good to go. And then on this last slide I have, um, you can go to the next one. Yeah, this is just a little information about storage space differences. So um, 
these numbers are pretty nice. So after you do your migration, the pulp uh, 3 Postgres database will be about 70 to 80% of the size of the Mongo database. And that is with the migration data in there. So um, the, the pulp team will be providing a tool internally so that once you do your migration and you're all done, that migration data will get cleared out. And once that's gone, um, the pulp core database will only be about 20 to 30% the size of Mongo, um, which is a great improvement. And then also, we give you a reminder about this, but just keep in mind that you want to make sure you have at least uh, two times the size, the storage size available in um, varlib pulp published of extra space, just because there's going to be a certain amount of metadata created. Um, you just need to make sure that you have enough space in there for that. And that is it for me. Um, I will be handing it over to James now. Hey, thanks, Ian. This is uh, James Jeffers. I'm one of the developers on the Catello team and working with uh, Pulp3 for the last year and a half or so. And I was going to go over some things that will help you uh, troubleshooting issues between Catello and Pulp Core. So the first thing that we'll note is that you can access the Pulp Core uh, database by using the uh, PSQL command. Um, I, I will also point out throughout this, uh, this entire presentation, We've added some links into the slides that will take you to some ASCII cinema uh, animations that will show you some of these commands as they're being run on an actual system. Um, OK, so you can use the uh, sudo command to assume the Postgres user and then connect to pulp core database. Of course, if your database is using a name other than pulp core, you would substitute it there. Uh, that will actually provide you with uh, access to that schema. You can go through and examine the pulp core uh, records. Uh, there is a pulp CLI coming soon. Uh, it's currently only in the proof of concept state. Uh, we've linked the project there. I think the pulp team is still looking for uh, guidance from the community about where to go with that. Uh, there are a couple of things to look at as far as being able to access the pulp core uh, API and content uh, through their uh, uh, HTTPS access with curl. So we've got two examples. The first one is very useful, is checking the status. And when you hit the status, it's going to return a JSON blob. And I think in a previous uh, presentation, people were talking about the JQ uh, command, which is very helpful for parsing that, J that JSON output. What the status will show you is the state of the various pulp core um, installed uh, packages, as well as some information about the current uh, state of the uh, API as far as memory and other resource consumption. The other example is if you know a particular pulp core href, you can access that directly as well using the provided keys. Um, and uh, we'll get into that a little bit more when we talk about Rails console commands. But again, that's an example where if you know that href, you can hit it. You're actually going to get a JSON blur. Go to the next slide. Uh, form and debug. There's been some updates for additional files. Uh, you can see it's got. Um, It'll show you this, the pulp uh, settings, which is uh, very useful, a, li a list of all the pulp core system units, the unit files, and the dynamic conf output. Um, the rake Catello correct repositories will still handle repository issues. Um, but generally speaking, a resync will also repair many of those issues at this time. Uh, it's interesting to note that the Catello re-import doesn't really work for all content types, because if they're handled by pulp core, uh, it'll just be skipped. So um, that's going to become less useful over time as we migrate more content types. Um, right now, pulp core is piping all its messages to varlog messages. You can always look there, but we've found it's pretty helpful if you use the general CTL command, and you can specify the uh, services with a wildcard, and that's going to get you a pretty good filtered list of messages coming out of pulp core, which is, again, pretty helpful if you get an error. Uh, Catello will, will generally provide you with a top-level error uh, summary, but sometimes, especially if you want to go back and try to debug what exactly is happening, uh, looking at those general CTL messages will give you uh, information like a backtrace uh, from the pulp core services that have been affected. Next slide, please. Uh, the additional troubleshooting, um, if you want to look at the Redis uh, worker queue, you can use the uh, rq-info command, and that's going to give you a breakdown of what you might see there. Um, there's some additional 
uh, interaction that you could use with the Rails console if you feel comfortable with that. So once you've identified a particular Catello repository, you can start to look at different fields uh, that are associated with a uh, pulp core, like a version href or a moat href. And these are going to, again, point back to publicly accessible um, URL endpoints, like we saw earlier with the, um, with the curl commands. Uh, you can also check for repository references and distribution references, which, again, uh, these are mappings from Catello objects back into the pulp core database. Uh, it's particularly useful to sanity check some of these items if you're starting to see behaviors that don't make sense. Uh, and again, the, uh, the link that's on that Rails console commands, um, that is a ASCII Cinema presentation, which will kind of display how you might go about doing that in an actual working system. As Ian was pointing out, since the applicability changes have been brought into uh, Catello at this point, we've got some additional things to look at in the Rails console. You can look at the Catello event count and the Catello applicable host queue depth. Um, and these are going to give you some information about whether or not events are being processed properly. So we begin to see issues with applicability. These are some things you can check to look at. And it might also be useful for folks that are trying to help you troubleshoot things. For example, if you're having a discussion in the forums. Uh, it's also sometimes useful. You can look into the uh, tasks, uh, uh, the form and task page in Catello. Uh, and you're going to look for a couple of items. Um, you can look for the bulk generate applicability for hosts, uh, task messages. And then if you look on the Dynflow console, you're going to look for actions that are similar to actions, Catello, applicability, hosts, bulk generate. And that will give you the breakdown for that task plus any sub plans. And that will give you some debugging information about uh, what items have been uh, provided to those tasks and what the outcomes were. Next slide. Uh, also pretty useful, although it's, it's very verbose. So um, you can enable debugging of the uh, pulp core API uh, as far as logging goes. And once you've enabled this, um, every single pulp API interaction will have a brief uh, output of the parameters that pulp is passing to the pulp client uh, library, as well as the responses that are coming back. And again, this can be pretty verbose, but if you really want to drill down on what Catello is providing and what the pulp APIs are returning, it's pretty useful. Of course, uh, once you've made that change, you will have to restart uh, all the appropriate services so you can see those out that output. All right, uh, as additional useful links is if you come across an issue that you think is um, uh, important, uh, you can always file new issues there at that uh, the pulp uh, project page. Uh, I will say that reading the pulp documentation, especially for the content plugins, is particularly helpful, uh, especially if you start uh, contributing to these projects, even in, from the Catello side. The pulp plugin documentation is really good. Uh, not only does it provide you with information about the APIs, but it also provides example workflows using uh, HTTP tools. Uh, and it really helps to solidify uh, what the expectations are as far as pulp core is concerned. It gives you a good, a good grasp of what uh, objects and concepts are important for pulp core. I think that's it. Uh, I'll turn it back over to Justin or anybody else who has questions. Um, and we'll make this presentation available. I'll work with um, uh, oh, with Melanie to do that. There we go. Let's see. Do we have any questions? Just one from Partha there in the chat. Do we have metrics comparing the performance of applicability per and hosts in Pulp three versus Pulp two? And are they around the same ballpark? Um, we don't have full, like sort of large scale tests, um, but we've tested individual systems, and they seemed it was about on par with what we saw in Pulp Two. But we do, we do look forward to working um, to get some more, I guess, uh, large scale testing done. Um, uh, around that.
Any other questions? Must have been super clear. <laughs> and I suppose if anyone is rewatching this, I'll post this to YouTube fairly soon, if that's OK with all of you. And if anyone has additional questions, we would love to hear from you on Form and Discourse. Just open a new thread or reply to the event. And um, we'd be very happy to, to hear your thoughts and to discuss any other points. Okay, we can, perhaps we can leave it there, um, finishing on time for once, which is miraculous. And if anyone here wants to discuss it further, we can bring it over to a breakout session at any point. So thank you, guys. Thank you, Bally.